Hey everyone, welcome to the Coastal Podcast. I'm Pastor Lucas Granger and want to say thank you for listening in. May this podcast bring some light to your world today. Enjoy grace and peace. Who's ready for some good news this morning? Come on. Some kingdom good news, the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, nobody will able to be able to say, here it is. No one will be able to say, there it is, for it's already among you. Already among you. It's like the glasses on your head that you can't find. <laughs> it's the keys in your pocket that you've been searching for for 30 minutes. There it is. It's like the oxygen in this room right now that you barely pay attention to, but is literally sustaining your life, the kingdom of God. And there's some good news that it is available today. But with this good news, I'm going to work on this a little bit, with this good news is also a little bit of bad news. Yes, there is. There's some bad news. The bad news is there is an enemy doing everything he can to keep you from living in this good news. There is a very real enemy, and he has a very real army of people with him doing everything he can to suck the oxygen out of this room right now, to suck the oxygen out of your life right now, for you to lose your keys and lose your glasses and never find them again. I had this thought this week. about getting a new stand. <laughs> I had this thought about uh, a car salesman, and forgive me if you're a car salesman in the room, but you knew going into the gig, people were gonna tell jokes. <laughs> we know y'all have a bad rap, so just accept it and own it. So I had this thought about this you know, used car salesman, and it's not just any used car salesman, it's like this dude that's just like, you know he's shady. You know he's trying to convince you that this 1984 Ford Taurus is the best car in Brunswick County. Low payments. And I had this thought of, you know, these two cars, and one of them's kind of the kingdom of the enemy, and the other's the kingdom of God, and it's Jesus and the devil, and they're standing there, and we're walking up to him uh, looking at our options, looking at what cars are on the lot. And we go up, and the enemy says something like this. You can ride today. You can ride today. Why go the way of Jesus? Look, that guy could get you killed. Ours is really shiny. Everyone, everyone wants one. They're really fast. You got to be cool. And to which Jesus is just like, you know what? Yeah, you may find ours slow at times. It's not as shiny. As a matter of fact, most of my staff rides a donkey. <laughs> Born in mangers. And as a matter of fact, if you ride over here, a lot of people will hate you for it. And to which the devil replies, see, I told you. Look, over here we have low cost, easy payments. Come on, come over here. And to which Jesus replies, yeah, over here it's going to cost you everything. As a matter of fact, you're going to have to leave father, mother, brother, sister. You're going to have to let the dead bury their own dead. As a matter of fact, over here, once you put the hand to the plow, don't even consider looking back. And to which the enemy is like, I'm telling you, I got this one in the bag. And so they step into the office. And as they step into the office, there's that moment where they just pull out all the paperwork. And you begin to look through the paperwork, and then you actually read the fine print. And you get to the fine print, and one kingdom, the kingdom of the enemy, says this. Oh, wait, wait, asterisk, this kingdom is fading away. Its foundation is built on lies and deceit and fraud. And though we promise freedom, its end result is slavery. And so you see the fine print on Jesus's, and it says this, this kingdom will last forever. 
Its foundation is built on truth and love and righteousness, and it is eternal, and it is true freedom. And so you're there, and you have a choice to make. Death or life. Eternal or temporal? Red pill, blue pill. And Jesus says there's death and there's life. Choose life. But how many of you know that we are notorious for choosing the temporary over the eternal? We are notorious for just give me the the shiny, fast red one. Give me, give me the instant gratification right now. Give me the other one. We live in a world where, listen, whatever's fastest, whatever's cheapest, whatever's easiest, sign me up. Fast, cheap, easy. As a matter of fact, some of the biggest companies in the world are built on this principle. Walmart, Amazon, McDonald's, fast, easy, cheap. If it's those three things, we want it. And we want it now. The problem with this is that we take the same approach to Jesus. We want a fast, easy, cheap Jesus to come alongside. We want Jesus to come alongside with what we're doing instead of us coming alongside with what he's doing. The end result of this is we have disciples that look more like the world than look like Jesus. And we're malnourished with full bellies. And we don't even know it's happening. The oxygen is being sucked out of the room. We've said yes to Jesus, but we've also said yes to the world. And it doesn't work that way. I remember I was in India, and uh, I was on the streets in southern India, Chennai, Madras, and there was this town that we were in, and there was all of these idols on the road, and people would go, and they would offer up their sacrifices to these idols, and there was, you know, literally there was the the elephant, and then there was a lady with all the arms, and there was all of these other gods, literally, literally hundreds of them. And as you're walking down these aisles, you would worship at each one, and people would go, and they would offer their sacrifices. Uh, and then there was the elephant, and the giraffe, and then the lady, and then there was the Virgin Mary, and then there was Jesus, and then there was another elephant. And you would watch as people would worship at each one, and you realize real quick, yeah, they've said yes to Jesus, but he's just one of a million other gods. And I've, I, that moment, you know, I was probably 19, I think, at the time when I saw this. And I remember thinking, man, we would never do that. And then I realized we do that all the time. We just worship different idols. The idol of entertainment. The idol of easy. The idol of fast. The idol of now. The idol of... Jesus, the idol of the next thing, and then we're frustrated with Jesus because he isn't working out the way we think he should. These kingdoms are lived out amongst us, and they are at war, the kingdom of the enemy and the kingdom of God. And so this morning, I wanted to bring an awareness to the tactics of the enemy, things that he's doing right now to prevent you from living in the kingdom of God, things that he's doing right now to suck the oxygen out of your soul. Are you with me? The book of Daniel, chapter 1. The book of Daniel, chapter 1. We started this last week. We're continuing on with it. It says this, beginning with verse 3. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of the staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Very important. To Babylon as captives. Select only the strong, the healthy, the good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, gifted with knowledge and of good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food, and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained there for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Now, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azra 
were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. We'll know them as Belshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It starts off, and we talked about this again last week, with select only the strong, the healthy, the good-looking. We want to build a kingdom where everything is built on this type of look on the outside. No broken seashells. There's a problem with this approach. The problem is we're all broken. The problem is we're all broken. And when you only look at outward qualifications, you can and will miss the best. If you only look at outward qualifications, you can and you will miss the best. We did this with Jesus. Because he didn't come like everyone thought. No, no, no. Not from that town. Not on that donkey. Not from that manger. Kings don't do like this. We're waiting for, them to, for Jesus to overflow, overthrow Rome so they missed him. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 says it like this. Man looks at the outside. God looks at the inside, the heart. Man, we have this tendency to look on the outside. Now, here's the thing. Daniel was all of these things. He was from the right family. He was strong. He was healthy. He was good looking. But here's the thing about Daniel. He was even bigger on the inside. He was even stronger on the inside. He was even more good-looking on the inside. You can never judge a person by what you see on the outside. It's that old saying, never judge a book by its Come on. But every one of us judge a book by its cover. You see that cover, and it looks like it was printed in 1972, and we're like, nope. We see that person that looks a certain way, and we instantly put them in a box in our mind. That says, whatever it is that you think about that, that person. We, we qualify these things by outward ap appearances. I, I remember very distinctly, Devin's in the room this morning for this story. I was in college, 18 years old, and this girl walks in the room. Not Devin. There was this other girl. I hadn't met her yet. She would have been like 13, and it would have been bad. So like, <laughs> I was like five years older than the girl. Went to work, girl. We need, we need a few years. So I'm 18, uh, going to college, and there's this girl, and I, she walks in the room, and she is hot. I'm like, whoo, this girl is smoking hot. I got to go talk to her. So I go up to talk to her, and within about three minutes, I was like, this girl is ugly on the inside. <laughs> ugly on the inside. How many know, like, you could fix ugly on the outside? They make Avon for that, y'all. They make some Maybelline. They make all, you could go out a spa day. You can fix ugly on the outside. But there's only one person that could fix ugly on the inside. Like, this girl needs some Jesus. Come on. You know what I'm saying? Do y'all get the point? We, we want to look on the outside. We're attracted to outside beauty. And when we're attracted to outside beauty solely, we're following the ways of this world. See, if, if the ways of the world is this where they start, this is exactly where we shouldn't start. Do I start making assumptions about people because of their appearance? Do I treat other people better or worse based on strictly outward factors? Am I missing the beauty that's all around me amongst the broken, the weak, the poor, the hurting, the beautiful, the strong, the popular, based on my own past insecurities? based on my own assumption, based on my own pain, if we are, we could be missing the Daniels among us. Step number one, in the kingdom of the enemy, create a culture that focuses solely on the outside. Step number one in the enemy's playbook, create a culture that focuses solely on the outside. Step number two, the scriptures tell us, listen, this is what I want you to do. Create these guys from the best families and, and, and the best people. And all, now teach them the language and the literature of our culture. Now this isn't talking about learning a new language, though that would be part of it for Daniel and, and, and these other young men and women that were hauled into captivity. 
it goes much deeper than just simply learning another language. It's talking about teach them our ways. Teach them our culture. Teach them what we call entertainment. All of this for one simple idea. Let's form their thinking. They've been thinking like Jews for too long. We want them thinking Babylonian. We want to form these young men's minds. Romans 12, 2 says it like this. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Some translations say by renewing your mind. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Now, some of us know that scripture, but you also got to realize the enemy uses that same playbook. While, the, while the, uh, Jesus wants to renew your mind, the enemy wants to deplete your mind. And so he's going to do everything he can to shape and to form the way you think. Because if I could change the way you think, I could change your actions. I could change what you do. I could reform your mind. C.S. Lewis says it like this. What do you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you? So if I could form the way that you think about God, it's going to change everything about you. Now, when C.S. Lewis was making that quote, that's a two-sided coin. Because it is the truth, but it's kind of a half-truth. Because what, what you think about when you think about God shapes everything about you. But it's not the ultimate truth. The ultimate truth is what God thinks when he thinks about you is the ultimate truth. And so we have to renew our mind to this place that says, God, give me the mind and the heart that when I think about me, when I think about others, I do it through your lens, through your mind. So give me the mind of Christ. Give me the heart of Christ to see people, to see myself, to interact to the world through a kingdom lens. Change my thinking. Renew my mind. See, Babylon wants to change their mind. See, Babylon wants these guys, uh, all of these Jews, to see them not as captors but as saviors. See, Babylon's learned a few things from Egypt. We're going to hold these guys captive, but we're not going to hold them captive with whips and with chains. We're going to hold them captive with entertainment. We're going to hold them captive with food from the king's table. We're going to get them so comfortable here that they forget all about their past. We're going to school them on the literature and the ways and the entertainment and the things that we do that they'll never even want to go back to Jerusalem. This is a whole different type of captivity. This is a captivity that's built on, no, come with us. It, it'll be, it promises comfort. It co promises rest. It promises food from the king tables. It promises wine that you've never drank before. And all the while, we are captive and don't even realize it. Some of us are captive to a car payment right now. Come on, somebody. Captive to Visa and MasterCard. The borrower is slave to the lender. Captive. Some of us are captive to what other people think about us. Some of us are captive to what we think other people think about us. Come on, somebody. Quick story. Uh, school just started, so they had school open house. And so I'm with my daughter, and we're going through the school, and there's this sign on the wall as we're waiting in line, and there's literally, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of people around. And there's this sign on the wall that's, you know, it's in all schools, it's the encouragement posters. You know, there's an eagle flying high, whatever. But then there's this one, there's a ballerina dancing. And on, on it, it's, you know, uh, live free, live joyous. And then on the bottom it says, dance like nobody's watching. And I thought, that's my cue. <laughs> and so my daughter's right there. I'm like, come on, girl, we got to follow the rules. Let's just dance. Dad, you're embarrassing me. And she's like, I don't know that guy. I don't know that guy. I'm like, it only gets worse from here, daughter. I'm just getting started. Because this is my job. But it was an important lesson later. So baby, don't live 
so fearful of what you think other people might think about you. There might be another girl that's looking and thinking, I wish my dad danced with me like that. You don't know. Don't let your own insecurities rob you of life. Let's dance like nobody's watching. Let's have fun. Let's have joy. Let me be your father. Let you be my daughter. Let me just hold you in my arms with thousands of people around you and look you in your eyes and tell you I love you and I'm proud of you. And who cares who's watching? Let the kingdom come in the middle of this middle school because we're not afraid. We're not held captive by somebody else's thoughts. We're not held captive by lust. We're not held captive by entertainment. John 3, 19 says, listen, men will love the darkness more than the light. The light has come into the world, and we love the darkness. Because what light that you let in your eyes, what light you let in your ears, it literally is reshaping your mind. It's reshaping the way you think. Can I get real honest with some of y'all this morning? Pornography is a huge thing in our culture. You know when you look at that, you're not looking at anything real. It's fake. And when you look at that, there's this promise of pleasure. And you think, oh, I'm not hurting anybody. Yes, you are. Because it's reshaping your mind. It's reshaping the way you look at women. It's reshaping the way you treat women. And guys, it's not just a man problem either. This is happening more and more amongst women. It's reshaping. We're buying into this life. It is a prison that we're willingly walking into. Held captive. And it comes with a virus. It will crash your hard drive. It will crash your passion. It will crash your drive for life. It will sneak in undetected. And all of a sudden, I don't know how I got this far along. Steal your joy. So much that all you want is the fake and you can't even handle the real. And science has shown this. It's reshaping your brain. It's reshaping your life. It's reshaping your language and how you identify the world and identify things around us. So ultimately what we're doing right here is we end up calling good evil and evil good. And we're seeing it more and more. Step number one, playbook of the enemy. Create a culture that looks solely on the outside. Step number two, create systems and habit to reshape your thinking. Let's twist what God's doing and let's make it our own. Step number three, and it says this, and the king assigned them food from his own table. Now, on the service, this doesn't look bad, because who doesn't love to eat? I mean, come on. We love to eat. This is America, y'all. There's food everywhere. We love to eat. But food takes on a huge part of our cultural identity. For the Jews at this time in this place, the Jews had very strict dietary restrictions. You can read all about it in Leviticus. You know, that's that part that you skip in your Bible reading plan. <laughs> you can read about all the things and, and kosher and what it means and the things that, but it's not just within the Jews, it's amongst all religions. For the Muslims, it's no pork. For the Hindus, no meat. For the Buddhists, no eggs or dairy. And all of these things begin to, tape into, to take on to form part of your identity and who you are. And so when the king is saying, come and let them eat from my kitchen, what he's asking him to do is to violate his conscience. I want Daniel, I want these young men, these young women, I want these Jews to come in and violate their convictions. I want to reshape their thinking. I want to reshape their ha habits. I want their convictions to be turned into preferences. But Daniel says no. No. This is not what God has said. His word clearly states that I can't do these things. And so when he's making this stand, it isn't just a stand against food. It's a stand against the consciousness of his mind. There's something in my mind, in my heart, that says, yeah, even though that's okay for you, it's not okay for me because God said so. And so from eating your table is a big deal. 
And, and so we have to know the difference between a conviction and a preference. And now this is a whole nother sermon, but <laughs> a conviction, real quick, a conviction you will die for. A preference has options attached to it. And we've confused the two. See, we go to war with people over our preferences. No, 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 no. We switch up. And our convictions, we just treat them like they're optional. No, no, no. Convictions is, you could die for this. Daniel, you could die for this decision. You are choosing to disobey a direct order from the king. You could die for this. See, we read the story and we know how it turns out. Daniel didn't. There's a good chance that this vegetable diet didn't work. There's a good chance that without the favor of God on his life, he gets killed in a few days. All of this happening. Daniel was willing to die for his conviction. See, the enemy wants you to be driven by your preferences and violate your convictions. And every time we do this, we end up with the type of cultural Christianity that's far away from Christ. See, on the surface, it looks like a stomach problem, but the reality is it's a heart problem. The enemy's trying to attack his heart. He's trying to get him to, to violate his beliefs and violate his conscience. Now, as I thought about this and reflected upon the American diet, which is are y'all somehow ready for this? <laughs> I thought, what, what, what could we sum up the American diet? Uh, the American diet, according to the smart people, is we're fed on a diet that is high in fat, low in nutrients. High in fat, low in nutrients. We love fatty foods. We love fatty, salty foods, very low in nutrient con- content. Uh, the, probably the perfect example of this would be bacon. Who doesn't love some bacon, y'all? Come on, you put bacon around anything, it's going to taste good. You put it around enough things, it's going to kill you. Come on. You put it around, you you, you live off a diet that's high fat, low nutrients, it's going to stop up your heart. So it leads us to the question, where do you find nutrition? What things in your life and my life are we feeding on? What are we feeding on? If we're feeding on a a diet of Netflix instead of Sabbath, it's bacon. It's going to kill you. If we're feeding on a diet of busy and busy and, and work and produce and produce and produce, and this is where we derive our identity from this feeling of success, bacon. It's going to kill you. Am I refreshed by the word of God or by ESPN? Bacon. See, nothing wrong with these things. Nothing wrong with some ESPN. Nothing wrong with some sports center. Nothing wrong with Netflix. But when we're solely getting our nutrients from that form, it's going to kill us. When we put it, to put it another way, when we are constantly feeding on things of the world, it will always lead us to a state of emergency. That state of emergency will always erode the mind and clog the heart. Your passion will die. Your thinking will change. You will be miserable. Step four. Let me, let me repeat the step three. Step one, create a culture that looks solely on the outside. Step two, create systems and habit to reshape your thinking. Step three, get people to break conscience and start this by feeding them on things that they shouldn't. What are we feeding ourselves? Finally, step four. It says they gave Daniel a new name. This is a shot shot straight to the heart. Because those names in those days, this was your identity. This is who you are. Your name meant something. And we're going to give you a Babylonian name. You're no longer Jewish. Now, there's a whole lot here, and I've run out of time, and we're going to talk about this next week. Do you see the pattern emerging? Do you see the enemy taking what God's doing and twisting it? He takes dietary restrictions and turns them into dietary indulgences. He turns renewing of the mind into depleting of the mind. He turns inner transformation into outward appearances. 
He takes what God has called you and that he calls you by another name. One gives way to the culture of the kingdom of this world and the other way gives way to the culture of the kingdom of God. And they are at war. You might not be able to see it. You might not be able to say, there it is or here it is. It is among you right now. Stand with me to your feet, please. So which one? Red pill, blue pill, the gospel of the kingdom of this world or the gospel of the kingdom of God? The gospel of the kingdom of this world says this, do whatever you want, indulge, indulge in all your fantasies, eat and drink. You don't need any discipline. Allow your emotions to form what you know. Think however you wish. As long as you look good, that's all that matters. You just have to appear right. You don't have to be right. Truth is relative. Feast on these things. Feast on these things day and night. Feast on these things that don't give you life. Formulate your life around a diet that's high in fat and low in nutrients. Come on, you can ride today. It's fast and it's easy and it's cheap and there's low monthly payments, but you're gonna be paying the rest of your life. It will bring you happiness, but for a moment. You will constantly have to be chasing the next best thing, the next greatest thing, the next thing that gives you that feeling of success. But ultimately, this kingdom is fading away and it will leave you wanting. Then there's the kingdom of God. And it says, no, you cannot have whatever you want. You serve a holy God. And you don't get to eat from this tree. This tree isn't for you. You can eat from all these other trees. You cannot eat from this tree. Your mind needs to be renewed. You don't get to shape God into the image that you want him to be. He shapes your mind. Your emotions do not have to rule you. You can rule over them. Your name is who I called you to be, and I don't care what anyone else says. And yeah, you can ride today, but it's going to cost you everything. Because this is truth. It is real. It is not relative. There is one way, the way, the truth, and the life, and his name is Christ Jesus. And just because it appears a certain way doesn't make it a certain way. See, it appeared like Jesus lost that day on the cross. It appeared like death won. It appeared like the enemy had taken over, but it just appeared that way. The truth is, the kingdom of God was coming in, and on the third day, he rose from the dead, and there's resurrection hope. And there's power in the blood of Jesus, so don't get caught up with how things just appear on the outside. There's kings riding donkeys, there's kids growing up in places that you think nothing good could come from that place. Just watch and see. The life of a man and woman whose heart is solely devoted to him. Shape me. Change me. Fill me with your spirit, Jesus. Pray with me this morning, church. Lord, we need you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Lord, we repent. Lord, for some of us, we've, we've been feasting on the things of this world. Teach us to feast on the things of you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We want you. You reign above it all. Reign above it all in my life in my hopes, in my dreams, in my marriage, with my kids, in my workplace. Be the Lord of my life. 
you're in the room today and you don't know him, may today be the day of your salvation. The kingdom of God is here and it's amongst you and it is welcoming you home, my son, my daughter. I want you. I want you. If that's you and you know you just need to surrender your life to Jesus, right now with every head bowed, with every eye closed, I'm asking you to just put your hand real high in the air. I just want to lead you into a prayer of salvation, a prayer of surrender. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm asking everyone to repeat after me. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I surrender. I surrender. My life is yours. My life is yours. I am yours. I am yours. You are mine. You are mine. Fill me up. Fill me up. Change my mind. Change my mind. Change my thoughts. Change my thoughts. Change my heart. Change my heart. Change my desires. Change my desires. It's yours. It's yours. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Amen. 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 Guys, give it up. We have someone in the room. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So good. Church, let's take a few minutes. Let's just worship together. Well, we hope this podcast has blessed you. In case you didn't know, we are in the middle of renovating a brand new facility right here in Brunswick County, North Carolina. So listen, two things. Please take a moment and pray for us. Also, if you'd like to give to the ministry, sign on to the website at mycoastalchurch.com slash giving. Hey, have a wonderful, wonderful day. Grace and peace.